Philippians chapter 2, verse 5, have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men. Being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. And for this reason, God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. We are under the Lordship of Jesus Christ. And the Lordship of Jesus defies all conventional wisdom as to what Lordship should look like. What our Lord did to be our Lord, to prove the love of God and and to come into the position of, of authority over us, rightfully earned, rightfully owned, is not what anybody on this earth does to become a Lord. He emptied himself. That's not what we do. We get full of ourselves in this world. We fill up, you know, we, we expand our resumes. We develop things. We have great accomplishments. We tout who we are and what we can bring to the table. But Jesus Christ emptied himself to become Lord. And it's just not the way we think. As far as power and prestige is concerned, Jesus is completely different. Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 1.20, Where is the wise man? And where's the scribe? And where's the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? But we preach Christ crucified to Jews a stumbling block, to Gentiles foolishness, but to those who are the called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. And that power and that wisdom is displayed in a God who emptied himself. The kenosis doctrine. That word he emptied himself, kenoo in the Greek. Now we talked about that. We looked at it on Sunday. But I just want to remind you of this as we continue on in the chapter, that Jesus Christ deprived himself of power from birth in a manger to death on a cross. He emptied himself of of the ability to just snap a finger and make it happen. He received power once again in his baptism as the Holy Spirit came upon him and John the Baptist said remained upon him. And so that power that was available to Jesus to heal, to teach, to feed, to care, that same power I do believe is available to us, but that power was best displayed in powerlessness as Jesus went to the cross and God exalted him to have the name which is above every name. This is the point of the kenosis doctrine. That Jesus emptied himself so that we would have this attitude among ourselves. What attitude? The attitude of emptiness. The attitude of of clearing ourselves out of being like the Lord whom we serve. But what does that look like? What does it look like to empty yourself? We know with Jesus, we, we watched him walk it out before us for 32, 33 years on the earth. So we can say, we know what the kenosis looks like in Jesus' life. What about your life? What about mine? How do we pattern ourselves after Jesus? And I believe Paul now gets into that. He applies the teaching. He can't help himself. And we've talked about, this is a friendship letter. This is not, you know, that, that deep, rich, full doctrine of Romans. You know, or that grace doctrine of Galatians. It's not that corrective doctrine of first and second Corinthians. It's not that high heavenly doctrine of, of Ephesians or that Christological doctrine of Colossians. All these different letters that are so doctrinally filled and then filled with practicality. This is just a friendship letter. And as we go on, you, you'll see when we get into chapter three, Paul just kind of goes all over the place. He has a thought here and a thought there and a thought there. Well, that's how friends write to one another. 
And so it's not really the intention of Paul to be gangbusters on doctrine, and yet what he teaches us about Jesus emptying himself is the most profound doctrine in all the Bible. Stuck right here in the middle of a letter from a friend to his friends. A very casual, seemingly off-handed letter in the way it's written, and yet absolutely profound. So along comes Paul doing what he does. He can't help it. He does gift this great doctrine, and then he returns right to, here's what it looks like. Here's how you live this. Here's what you do with this. And he does it immediately with three sentences in which we see Paul has a threefold concern for Philippi. I believe there's a divine threefold concern for us. Three sentences. Verses 12 and 13 is the first sentence, and we could call this a joyful exercise. Verses 14 through 16, a joyful evidence. And then finally, verses 17 and 18, a joyful expense. A joyful exercise, joyful evidence, joyful expense, and we'll just follow the apostle as he teaches us. First, he shows us a joyful exercise. Look at verse 12. So then, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now, much more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Boy, this verse has been a problem for Protestants for ages. Catholics don't mind. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. I mean, have you seen the nuns? I mean, you do what they say, you know, or you're going to get a rapping across the knuckles. It's always those stories about Catholic school and what that does to a person. Maybe you went to Catholic school and you can relate. Work out your salvation, Paul says. And so Protestant Christianity literally for centuries has argued about what does that mean? How can Paul in one place say by grace you are saved and in another place say work out your salvation? How do you do that? Exercise your salvation. It's what he's talking about with a a workout regime of fear and trembling. Again, how does that square with grace? Note this, pay attention to this. He does not say work for your salvation. He says work out your salvation. And you can also note it's already a reality with his friends there in Philippi. Because he says, so then, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Guess what? Paul is not talking to non-believers. He's talking to believers. This verse is directed to people who already have salvation. So the issue is not, here's how you get saved. Work for it. Prove yourself. Make yourself worthy. No, these people already have been saved. And so now in that state of savedness, in their salvation state, Paul says, now work it out. You're saved. Exercise your salvation. Not a message about how to get saved. It's a message to the already saved. The word here, work out, is kater gadzomai. For those of you Greek scholars, I know you like to jot these words down. Kater gadzomai literally means to fashion or do something with thoroughness. To see something through to the end. To press on, as Paul will say in chapter 3, verse 14. In fact, he, he uses the same word, work out, in several different letters that he writes. Let me give you a, a picture of this, the way he uses it elsewhere. It's differently translated. Here, what is translated work out in 2 Corinthians 4.17, he says, For momentary light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison. That's kater gadzomai. It's producing something in me. It's not producing salvation. I, I am saved, but when I encounter trials, when I have light affliction, when I have tr- uh, troubles and sufferings, it's producing kater gadzomai. It's working out that salvation in me. It's in process. Uh, he, he says in Ephesians 6.13, what we just recently read, take up the full armor of God so you will be able to stand, to resist in the evil day, and to and having done everything, having done, kader gadzomai, having worked out, having progressed, having produced, 
Having seen it through, he says, to stand firm. That's the concept behind the word of working out your salvation. I'm saved and I'm going to see this through to the end. I'm going to go all the way to the end of the track. I'm going to see Jesus there. I am going to endure. I'm going to press on. And the idea is what you are doing with the salvation you already have. You're saved. Work it out. You're saved. Walk it out. Because the truth is, and you all know this, salvation does not does not create or produce instant holiness. I mean, let me just, I want to run this by, make sure I didn't miss somebody on this, but the, if you became a Christian and the day you became a Christian, were you instantly holy? Anyone? Now, I can tell you this, you were instantly made holy in the eyes of God. He saw you in that moment of your salvation when you accepted Jesus Christ clean, pure, righteous, holy, saved. Saints, as we've talked about recently. But did you feel holy? Did you automatically do all holy things? Do you still? How's today been? Anyone have some non-holy moments today? I had one yesterday. I was really angry and I slammed my car door. I know it's a shocker to you. It's okay. I paid for it. My window won't go up now. So I get to deal with that. So I get in the car and I look and I go, yep, non-holy Rick. Still needing to work out my salvation with fear and trembling. (laughs) It's the deal. We don't instantly become holy. I mean, salvation doesn't produce instant holiness, instant holy behavior, any more than new gym membership instantly makes you buff. If that were the case, my Thrive membership that I've had for years would have done something by now. (laughs) Well, Rick, do you go to the gym? No, but I have membership. Isn't that enough? Doesn't that count for something? Not where the muscles are concerned. Membership does not make it happen. Salvation doesn't instantly create or develop this this holy character in you. That is worked out. Work out your salvation. That's what Paul's saying. 1 Timothy 4, 7, he says, Discipline yourself for the purpose of godliness. Bodily discipline is only of little profit, but godliness is profitable for all things, since it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. Work that out. Or as Fee puts it, flesh it out. I kind of like that. Flesh out your salvation with fear and trembling. Feed into it. Develop it. Work on it, exercise it, or as Paul originally said back in chapter 1, verse 27, only conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. You know what he's saying? He's saying you have a part in this. You have a responsibility, or perhaps we should say you have a response to the salvation you've been given. My response is what I do with the salvation that Jesus gave to me. Some respond by doing nothing. I'm saved. I'm good to go. I got to change stuff too? Why? Well, because you're saved. My response to what he's done. The lordship of the humble but exalted Jesus Christ is the key here to this holy work. Because once you recognize that you're saved by him, once you see him as your Lord, then suddenly that changes things. He says, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. Not to prove yourself, but because that's what happens when you love him. When you love Jesus Christ as Lord, you want to please him. You desire to do what he's called you to do. You'll want to work this salvation out. Yeah, but but with fear and trembling. I'm not sure if I like that one. I mean, I thought perfect love casts out fear. People love to go to that quote. And they're right. It it does. In fact, John wrote, 1 John 4, 18, there is no fear in love. But Paul says, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Listen, there's no fear in love, he says, because perfect love casts out fear, because fear involves punishment, and the one who fears is not perfected in love. If you're fearing damnation... If you're fearing hell, if you're fearing being punished, well, then you don't realize the grace of God that saves you. But when you realize that you are saved by his grace and hell is not a factor, that's not the kind of fear we're talking about here. 
To work out your salvation with fear and trembling means I recognize the seriousness of my salvation. I see what Jesus did to provide it. I'm beginning to understand the weight of my salvation as blood bought by Jesus. Man, that causes me to tremble. That brings about a holy fear that Jesus would go from heaven to humanity to the cross to the tomb to work out my salvation. So yeah, I work out my salvation with with a, a healthy degree of fear and trembling, an attitude of humble obedience, the same kind of obedience that Jesus evidenced in his life. When he became obedient even unto death, death on a cross, he, he walks this out. He shows us this kind of trembling. And I love Psalm 2, verse 11, that says, Worship the Lord with reverence, and note this, rejoice with trembling. You know, the fear and trembling he's talking about when he says, Work out your salvation with fear and trembling, it is a joyful fear. It is a rejoicing trembling. It's not a terror, it's a holy sense of the divinity of God, of His grandeur, His glory, His majesty, and how far He stooped to reach me. It's this deep awe and respect. Do you do 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 that? Do you rejoice with trembling? I've told Rachel, and you did it again tonight. You pull out the Revelation song, and I'm done. I mean, we can be singing along and everything's good and all of a sudden worthy is the lamb that was slain holy holy is he and I am trembling every time because that's the deal it's the Lord Jesus whom we serve it's the Lord Christ that I bow before and that makes me tremble and it is a joyful exercise so this idea of working out your salvation in fear and trembling this is a good thing It's what we're called to do. It's called sanctification. Work on it. Exercise it like you would exercise a muscle. Grow in this salvation. For after all, it is not just for you. Oh, you're talking about lost people. No, I'm talking about the Lord. Look at verse 13. For it is God who is at work in you, both to will and to work for His good pleasure. He's doing this because he gets a kick out of it. Because it delights God to energize your faith, to work in your salvation, to work in you working it out. That's what Spurgeon says. We must work out because God works in. I like that. He's working in, I'm working out. That's the deal. By the way, if he wasn't working in, I wouldn't have the strength to work out. And it's interesting that Paul uses different words here, uh, even for work. But God's work in verse 13 is different than my work in verse 12. I work out my salvation with fear and trembling. I'm seeing it through. I'm enduring. I'm hanging in there. I'm, I'm exercising my salvation. But God's work is a different word. It's not kater gadzomai. It's energeo. Sound familiar? It's where we get our word energy. So Paul literally says, for it is God who is at work, who energizes in you both to will and to energize for his good pleasure. He's the one who provides the power. This is the power we didn't have before we got saved. This is the power of the Spirit of God. This is the power we're talking about in the kenosis doctrine. Jesus emptied his power, and then in his baptism, the Holy Spirit comes upon him. And the power then is there to effect the miracles and to do the great things that he did, that he also said, you'll do. You'll do these things. And you will have the power to be powerless like Jesus was. And I need that. I need that inner ghetto, that, that working of God in me. And as He works in me, it's, it's God's work that makes my work work. Does that make sense? And without the working of God, the energy of God, that dynamic power of God working in me, I'm not going to follow through. I'm going to flake. Because that's more the natural human tendency is after a while we just move on to something else. 
But when the inner ghetto of God, when the work of God is in you, when he is at work in you to will and to work for his good pleasure, now you've got a power to work out your salvation, to exercise your sanctification. Keep your finger here and, and turn back over to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, just for a moment. 1 Corinthians 12. Paul uses the same word in this passage, and I want you to see the context of it. And again, understanding what, what the Lord does when he works in as we work out. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 4, Paul says there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are varieties of ministries in the same Lord. There are varieties of effects, but the same God who works all things in all persons. He works. He intergettos all things in all persons. But to each one is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, and to another the word of knowledge according to the Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by the one Spirit, to another the effecting of miracles, to another prophecy, to another the distinguishing of spirits, and to another various kinds of tongues, and to another interpretation of tongues. But one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually just as he wills. He works. He intergettos. He's at work empowering us to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. I like the way A.T. Robertson looks at these two verses. Back in Philippians chapter 2, verse 12, verses verse 13. Verse 12 sounds like a good Arminianist. Work it out. And verse 13 sounds like a good Calvinist. God's at work. God's sovereign. But see, Paul says both. And Robertson says this. He exhorts as if he were an Arminian in addressing men. And he prays as if he were a Calvinist in addressing God. And Paul feels no inconsistency with the two attitudes. Where Protestant Christianity has divided, and maybe you don't even know Arminius. Maybe you don't, you're not familiar with, with his teaching, which is the whole free will side of Christian doctrine. And then there's Calvin on the other side, which says everything's predetermined. God is sovereign. The reality is God is sovereign, and you have free will. The reality is God knows exactly what you're going to do, but you have the right to choose to do it. Even though God already knew you were going to do it, but you chose it. It's both. It is not either or. And Paul proves as much when he says, hey, you work it out for God's at work. You see how it works? It's both him and me. We're working together on this. Paul makes no attempt, Robertson says, to reconcile the divine sovereignty of Calvinism and the human free agency of Arminianism, but boldly proclaims both. You are working it out. And... God is at work in you. And he says at the end of verse 13, he does all this for his good pleasure. And the word pleasure there, it is delight. It's sheer delight. It's that, that sense of a parent just delighting in a child. It's satisfaction. God is at work in you. He's not toying with you. It's not like pleasure like a, a cat playing with a mouse. I saw this the other day. Uh, our friends, the Hoffmans, Mike is one of our shepherds and his daughter, Hillary. Is Hillary here tonight? Okay, good. We can talk about her. She has a video of this cute, adorable little kitten that they just recently got. And she has a video where this little kitten attacks a mouse and is just playing with the mouse. It's, it's hilarious and tragic at the same time. It's one of those horrifying things you just can't stop watching. As this kitten goes flip and the mouse tries to run away and the cat grabs it and throws it over here and the mouse lays there and thinks maybe if I just play dead, you know, and back and forth and the, and the cat's playing with this and people see God that way. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I see what it says. He's at work to will and to work for his good pleasure. He's just toying with us. No, he's not. His good pleasure, his delight is to see you made righteous. He delights in the, the joy that comes as your salvation gets stronger, as your sanctification continues, as, as you grow in your faith, He just delights in you. He loves to watch this happen and to be part of the process. I'm going to give more energy here because Rick needs it. And as he grows, I delight in that. 
I love that. And this is the attitude of the Father, sheer delight. Proverbs 3, verse 12 says, For whom the Lord loves, He reproves, even as a father corrects the son in whom He delights. And of course, the Hebrew writer quotes that in Hebrews 12. Psalm 22, verse 8, Commit yourself to the Lord. Let Him deliver Him. Let Him rescue Him, because He delights in Him. Now, see, we would read it this way, I think. Now, I may be wrong about you, but I would tend to think, let him rescue him is let God rescue me because he delights in him. I would think is because I delight in God. So I prove that I delight in you, Lord, so you rescue me. But that's not what it says. Let God rescue me because God delights in me. That's mind boggling. I mean, think about that tonight. Maybe, maybe that's the message somebody needs to hear tonight. God delights in you. He's not sitting around going, well, you better delight in me or you're out. He delights in you. Men, as a son, he delights in you. Ladies, as daughters, he delights in you. This is the great, glorious God of the universe. And he takes delight in personal engagement in your life. You work it out. He works in and he is delighted. The, The implication is just huge. I mean, I think on a very small scale how much I delighted in my daughters this last weekend. I think I shared with you that Mary Poppins was the ballet that they were dancing in. Honoree was sick. Major head cold. I mean, it was, it was a bummer. I didn't even know she was going to be able to make the ballet. And she's, you know, got up the morning of Saturday morning of the, the first performance was that afternoon. She's like, good morning, Dad. I'm like, oh, man, this is a bummer. I'm just like, I'm like, drink lots of fluids. <laughs> she got out there. She danced just beautifully. I delighted. She got home Saturday night. And, and Honor and Naomi were just, they're fantastic. Of course, they're my daughters, right? It's all in my gene pool. <laughs> where they're getting the, the gift of dance. It comes from my side of the family. Anyway. Honor me and Naomi come in the door and they're just a glow of the dancing and everything. And Honor me still talking like this when I dance tonight, Dad, you know. And she, and, and she said, Happy Father's Day, Dad. I was dancing for you. Oh. Right? Talk about delight. I mean, if you had a little delight meter on me, I was already like up here. And when she said that, I was like, ding, 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 ding. <laughs> wow. That's the kind of relationship God has invited us into. Ladies, that's the kind of relationship your father wants with you, where he delights in you, and you dance for him, which causes his delight to increase. Gentlemen, we don't have to necessarily dance for him. Maybe that's a little weird. But he delights in you, and you run for him, or whatever, fight for him. But we respond, and he responds, and then we respond more, and then he responds more, and we work it out, and he works it in, and it's, it's just, that's, that's the way salvation works. And Paul lays this out for Philippi, and he says, look, this is, this is the deal. And, and honestly, I think there's nothing more wonderful than knowing that my Abba delights in me. When I remember that, you can throw anything at me all day long, but if I know my Abba delights in me, it's going to be all right. Work it out. It's a joyful exercise. And Paul says, you want to have this mind in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, not only for the joyful exercise in your salvation, but also there's a joyful evidence. Verse 14. Do all things without grumbling or disputing. And I want to clarify for you, the Greek for all things is literally translated all things. Do all things, not some things, not most things, not a few things, not church things. Do all things without grumbling or disputing. The word disputing can also be translated murmuring. So that, (laughs) I heard I'm in trouble. So that you will prove yourselves to be blameless and innocent children of God above reproach in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you appear as lights in the world holding fast the word of life so that in the day of Christ I will have reason to glory because I did not run in vain or toil in vain. And the last part of the sentence there is vintage Paul. I want you to do this because, man, on the day of the rapture, I want to know that my ministry wasn't futile. 
I want to know that what I seeded in you, what I planted there at Philippi, I want to be able to look at that and go, wow, that's awesome. Praise the Lord. I want, I want to know it wasn't vain. Paul, something I love about this man, he took utmost responsibility for their faith. We have more of a tendency to take utmost responsibility for our own faith at that, but I'm not really worried about you and your, you just deal with your own deal. You know, you disciple you. I got enough issues with just me. I'm working it out here. And Paul's like, no, I, I am, I am so concerned with Philippi, with Corinth, with Colossae. Man, my heart is there in Ephesus. He was so concerned for everybody else. He had personal responsibility for them. He's telling them, oh, I want you to appear as lights in the world. I want to know that I can, that I can glory. And that word glory, I'll tell you in just a moment what it means. But he says, I, I want to, I want to sense that, that we've gotten to the end of the race together in this. I want this for you, Philippi, Paul would say. I had to pause when I read that and think, do I do that? Do I, do I think that way? Do you? Are we that concerned with the discipline of someone else? With the discipleship of another person? It is a necessary part of the workout. You know, Camberley Barksdale has this thing on Thursday mornings for women called Pray It Out. And they, they work out together and they pray together and do this thing. And ladies, if you're interested, talk to Jake. He's, he's next door with the kids right now. But, but Camberley's got this thing going on. And it's something they do together. Because, you know, people have realized if I work out in a group, it's better for me. I actually work out better. If I have to work out by myself, Cheryl and I, years ago, we bought one of those, um, one of those treadmills. It's not a treadmill, it's the other thing. But, but, yeah, an elliptical. Cool. Spent our Christmas money on an elliptical. Set it up in the house. I'm like, man, I'm going to be in such good shape. <laughs> Like three months later, I'm looking at that going, anybody going to use that? Because it's kind of taking up some space here, you know. By yourself? Eh. But that's why we have gyms. Go to the gym. There's all other people that are pumping iron and stuff. And, you know, I love what Brian Regan says. He says, I went to the gym, and, and I don't know how to do anything. So I got in this one machine, and I start to push things and pull things. And I'm doing this. And some guy walks out and goes, hey, dude, you want to get out of the painter scaffolding there? I don't know what you're doing. <laughs> We work out better together. And there is evidence of our faith that takes place together. And Paul has that. And so he's saying now to his friends at Philippi, let your faith be evident. If you're going to have this attitude in you, which was in Christ Jesus, let it be evident. Later on, he'll write to Timothy and say in 1 Timothy 4.13, Take pains with these things, be absorbed in them, so that your progress will be evident to all. Hey, you want to wear your discipleship on your sleeve. You want people to see that you are growing in the Lord, not as a point of pride, but as a point of encouragement for their faith. You know, what does it do to you when someone comes up to you and goes, Hey man, I was in my quiet time this morning and I was reading about such and such. You know what God says in this? And they start to share and you're like, Well, I didn't have quiet time this morning. But that's not a bad idea. Let your faith be evident to other believers. It becomes an amazing source of encouragement when we work it out together. It's not showmanship, it's discipleship. But go back to where he started, verse 14. So he says, do all things without grumbling or disputing. He encourages them, I want you to be blameless and innocent. And then he uses the phrase, as lights in the world. Israel was first called to be a nation of priests. You know, originally, and you can look it up, Exodus 19.6, God did not originally intend to have a priestly tribe. He intended to have a priestly nation. Levi would become the singular priestly tribe of Israel among the 12 tribes. But originally God said, I am calling you to be a nation and a kingdom of priests. Translated into our understanding... Israel was originally called to be an evangelical nation. They were to be lights to the world. 
They were to be the representation of a relationship with God and to invite the world into that kind of righteousness. That's what God at first offered to the people. What happened? Well, Paul tells us. He tells us in another place, but it's a place where he he uses the same word he uses here. Do all things without grumbling. Paul only uses the word grumbling in one other place in all of his letters. It's 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 10, and it gives us a little insight into what Paul is thinking right here. 1 Corinthians 10.10, he says, let's not grumble as some of them did, speaking of Israel, and were destroyed by the destroyer. Now these things happened to them, Israel, as an example, and they were written for our instruction upon whom the ends of the ages have come. And so I can tell you with absolute assurance, and I'll prove it to you, that when Paul talks about grumbling here, do all things without grumbling or disputing, he is drawing off the example of Israel. He is remembering, he is thinking about Israel. Let me show you how. In Genesis 17, verse 1, when Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty, walk before me and be blameless. Be blameless. Be holy, he would later say to the people, as I am holy. Blamelessness was a character trait that God called for in Israel. It's what he wanted for Israel. And what does Paul say in verse 15? So that you will prove yourselves to be blameless and innocent. Don't grumble. Don't murmur. Don't dispute. Because blamelessness is on the line. That's the behavioral pattern. And please get this. This is about as practical as it gets. The behavioral pattern seen in Israel and sometimes in us that blows up blamelessness is grumbling. Paul says you want to destroy holiness? You want to mess up that whole working out your salvation thing? Grumble. You you want to be (laughs) anti-sanctified? Grumble. You want to undermine the whole thing? Grumble. Deuteronomy 127 tells us of Israel, they grumbled in their tents. They closed the tent flap, they looked around, husband and wife got their heads together and they said, do you think Moses has any clue that what he's doing? He brought us out here into the middle of the wilderness, oy vey, here we are. That Moses, that Aaron, that Miriam, oh, they think they're something special. They grumbled behind closed doors. I, I, now I know that never happens in our fellowship. I know that's not something that Christians ever do. We never go home and grumble in our wigwams. You know? Psalm 106.24 says they did not believe in God's word, but grumbled in their tents. They did not listen to the voice of the Lord. Mark this, brothers and sisters. Grumbling and disputing have the effect of putting out the light that we are called to shine in this world. You don't even have to be grumbling in the world. See, that's, that's the point that sometimes we miss. Oh, I would never grumble about my church to a non-believer. It doesn't matter. If you're grumbling about your fellowship behind closed doors, you are putting out the light that you would otherwise have for a non-believer, whether they hear you grumbling or not. Because grumbling takes down your spirit. Murmuring douses the light that would otherwise be in you, be in me. And I am as guilty of this as anybody. The grumbling that goes on. Did you see what she did? Man, just so 